We're now going to study the so-called gains from trade that two people obtain by exchanging goods with each other. I'll read and then explain what I have in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. We're going to consider, as it says, a pure exchange economy with two persons, call them Smith and Jones, and two commodities, apples of which there are five and bananas of which there are four. So a pure exchange economy is an economy in which there's no production. Either all the production has already occurred, or no production is necessary because, let's say, apples and bananas grow on trees, so one just gets them directly from nature. So we're not going to have firms here because there's no production. We're going to have two persons called Smith and Jones, and we can think of them as being traders. In fact, uh, perhaps the simplest way to think about this is Smith and Jones are two traders in medieval Europe. Each one of them has a basket of goods or a cart laden with goods. Uh, suppose you know, Smith has a cart laden with uh, apples and Jones with bananas. Of course, in medieval Europe there weren't any bananas, but forget about that. And they meet on a country road in the middle of nowhere so that there's no possibility for production, but there is possibility that they start talking with each other and determine whether uh, it's uh, whether they're mutual beneficial trades. Uh, a very important concept in all neoclassical economics, but it shows up very clearly w in this topic, is the voluntary nature of these trades. There's absolutely no coercion that's assumed. All the trades are voluntary, and if one of them doesn't want to trade, he doesn't have to trade. Now, it's not that neoclassical economics is incapable of analyzing situations in which there's coercion. It is, but in many neoclassical analyses, and this is and this is what we've been doing all semester long, we've been assuming that there isn't any coercion. Uh, theft, of course, isn't possible. If something has a price, you have to pay for it. But um, but otherwise, there's no coercion. Now the example I'm going to use is a little bit more complicated than the one I just described, but not much. Label this corner Smith. I'm going to use this box to denote how many apples and oranges S Smith and Jones have. So apples are going to be measured on the horizontal axis, and bananas on the vertical axis. The complication I'm going to make is that I'm not going to assume that all the apples belong to one of the agents and all the bananas belong to the other. Let's assume that um, that Smith has some bananas and some apples, and Jones has some bananas and some apples. The rectangle that you see in front of you is called, as it says in the middle part of the screen, the edgeworth bully box. Actually, most people call it the Edgeworth box. A bully apparently was the first person who invented this in the 19th century, but Edgeworth was a much more famous 19th century English economist, and so most people call it the Edgeworth box, even though that's really not the right term for it. In fact, it probably just should be called the bully box. The width of this box, you recall that the horizontal axis measures apples. The width of this box is the number of apples in the whole economy. Okay, and by the economy, I mean the the joining of Smith and Jones, because as far as we're concerned, these are the only two people that are around. So there are five apples total in the whole economy, and therefore the width of the box is five apples. There are four bananas total in the whole economy, so the height of the box is four bananas. Let's suppose that in Smith's basket there are, say, three apples and one banana. That would make his point approximately here in the box. We call this point an initial allocation.
So Smith's initial allocation is three apples and one banana. Now, a really nice feature of the Edgeworth box, in fact, the whole reason why we use an Edgeworth box, is because it's quite easy once we know how many apples and bananas Smith has to figure out how many, ap many apples and bananas Jones has. Let's think about apples. We know there are five apples total in the whole economy. Smith has three of them. Well, if there are five apples total in the whole economy and Smith has three of them, Jones has to have the other two. So we know that the initial allocation for Jones is two apples. Similarly, the entire economy has four bananas. Smith has one of them, so Jones has to have the other three. And therefore, the initial allocation for Jones also includes three bananas. I claim that we can measure this on the Edgeworth box. Think about two apples. I claim that this distance is two apples. And the reason is that this distance is three apples, and the whole width is five apples. So, therefore, the distance that I marked with 2 has to be 2 apples, which is the number of apples that, that Jones has. Similarly, this distance is 3 bananas, because this total distance is 4 bananas, and Smith has one of them. So I claim that if you mark the upper right-hand corner with Jones and decide to measure Jones's apples going to the left and Jones's bananas going down, then this point represents Jones's allocation because it represents one, two apples and one, two, three bananas, which is what Jones has, two apples and three bananas. So that's the reason why the Edgeworth box is so handy, that just placing one point describes not only an allocation for Smith, but also an allocation for Jones. An allocation, by the way, this word here, allocation, is just a list of Jones gets this many apples, Jones gets this many bananas, Smith gets this many apples, Smith gets this many bananas. Let's add indifference curves to the box. Smith's indifference curves, well, both of them are going to have absolutely standard indifference curves. We're not going to do anything different than we did in consumer theory. So Smith's indifference curves will look like this. And we're particularly interested in the indifference curve that he starts out with before he, or just when he meets Jones, which is the indifference curve that goes through his initial allocation. This corresponds to his initial level of utility. Let's call it u naught for Smith. What's trickier is to figure out Jones's indifference curves. Well, Jones is going to have absolutely standard indifference curves. So you have apples here and bananas here. His indifference curves are going to be the usual shape. Now, if you rotate that 90 degrees clockwise, you'll get A and B like this, 
and you rotate that another 90 degrees clockwise, I'll get A and B like this, and the curves will be shaped like this. So this is the way that Jones's indifference curves will be drawn on the Edgeworth box. It's not because they're weird. They're not weird. They're the usual kind of shape that we've typically been assuming for indifference curves. But rather, since Jones's axes have been turned around, since, since his origin is in the upper right instead of the lower left, that's the reason why the indifference curves appear to be Jones's indifference curves are going to appear to be strange. So Jones's indifference curves will look like this. And again, we're particularly interested in the one that passes through the initial allocation point. We'll draw it as follows. And Jones, of course, has other indifference curves like this and this and this, and Smith has others like this and this and this and so forth. In the next video, we'll see what Smith and Jones are going to do given this setup.